You're listening to Thunderheads, a podcast for Thunder fans by Thunder fans. Welcome to Thunderheads. It's Brandon, Rob, and Jason joining you. We got our super special guest. I can't believe this is actually happening. It's really cool for us. Uh, probably not as cool for him. But <laughs> let's go ahead and introduce the man. It is the NBA champion himself, Antonio Daniels. Man, you've become like the voice of the Thunder fan. You know no, this? I haven't. Yeah, you That's have. No, I have it. It's no. true. Would you guys no. agree with that? Uh, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. It's like this year, though. I think like you do a really good job, and I didn't plan on just like, you know, Buttering your bread. Buttering your bread right off the bat, <laughs> but, I, but I'm about to. I, I swear, though, this year, you, you do a really good job of uh, just kind of conveying the, th- the, kind of the regular Thunder fans' thoughts on TV. And I think that makes them feel comfortable. And it's something that, honestly, the Thunder broadcast in the past hasn't always had, and not everyone's always looked forward to watching the post game with you, with Leslie, man. It's like a must-watch now. So you're doing well, a great job. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, for myself... I tell you my thought process of approaching this job. It's basically, and you can hold me to this. Mm -hmm. Moving forward, you can hold me to this. I will never say something about anyone in that locker room or anyone in the organization, the coach, general manager, anyone, that I would not mind being said about me if I was in that same locker room. That's how I approach the job. You know, so often people will tweet at me and tell me to call a guy out. And right. Why doesn't the guy do this? Or why doesn't the coach? I'm not about that. Yeah. I'm really not about that. I'm going to approach my job as if when that game is over, I'm sitting in that locker room with those guys. And what would I say to them if I was sitting in there with them? Because in my 13 year career, I've been in a lot of the same situations that I'm getting an opportunity to witness now. So when I'm saying, well, this is what I would say, it's probably because I probably said it before Mm -hmm. or it's been said in a locker room that I've been in before. You know, in the locker room, you don't sit there and point fingers at each other and call guys out and call out the coach. That's that's not what being a team is about, you know. But you also can't ignore what's going on either. Right. So I try and convey it in a way where I'm not calling guys out. I will never, ever do that. I will never do that. I'm not there to call guys out. That's not my job. My job is to analyze the game and approach it as if I'm in that locker room with those guys. Yeah, and I think the biggest part, what's sort of refreshing for for us watching it, is that it seems constructive. Like whenever there is something that needs to be changed, that's where you come in and you do. You have like constructive criticism is what I'll say, where it's sort of what we see as well. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you see it. You've been Mm -hmm. in those situations. You have you know, a a bigger sort of impact too because you have all these people watching. But I will say it's sort of refreshing and and just to hear you sort of approach it that way, I think that's why because it just seems real and it comes comes off that way. You know what? I've always been, and I, and I, I'm going to, I was an emotional player. I was an emotional (laughs) player. I am an emotional analyst. I am. So if wearing my emotions on my sleeve means that, you know, that's a bad thing, I think that's it's a great thing. Definitely not. That's what I said. That, that, I'm gonna be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> if wearing my emotions on my sleeve is a bad thing, then I'm I'm definitely gonna be wrong. But I do agree with you. I, I think there's a way to to go about saying things that sometimes need to be said without beating somebody to the ground and not beating a team to the ground. You know, because no matter how you look at it, and and what we do is we say, oh well, you know what? These guys aren't human. You know, they can jump out the gym. Right. They make a ton of money or whatever it may be. They have families. They right. have egos. They're sensitive. They're just like you and I. And also, they care. But exactly. It's not like they don't care. Exactly. And that's <laughs> that. That's the thing that that a lot of people don't understand. So, after a broadcast, if I'm frustrated, I'm not half as frustrated as those guys that just went out there and dealt with it. You right. know. So. Yeah, because that it like actually just happened to them. Right. <laughs> right. And my job is just to kind of sit back and analyze why what happened just happened. So, right. with that being said, when you are watching a game throughout the game. You know, you're about to do your show at halftime or it's third quarter, whatever. How emotional do you get? How on the edge of the seat do you get? Or do you have to kind of stay back and try to think rationally? Or you get? Oh, no, no, no. I have to think rationally when that camera comes. Yeah, on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but prior to that camera being on, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's sometimes it's it gets a little it gets a little because the thing is, I'm not gonna lie to you. I've known Sam Presti since I was in San Antonio. I've known right, Sam because, oh, yeah. right. I've known Sam Presti since 2002. Okay. You know, so this, we go back ways. Mm-hmm. I, when I come down here and I go to shoot around, I have long conversations with Sam Presti. Great basketball mind. 
great man, great father, great husband. So when I'm invested, it's because I want these guys to succeed. Mm -hmm. You know, I have nothing to gain by by this team winning or losing. Right. I have nothing to gain for the fact that me and my house, we are Thunder fans. Mm -hmm. My wife, my two daughters. I can show you a picture of my daughter on my phone on Sunday at church. They give them the last 10 minutes to color whatever they want to color. <laughs> and she colored a rainbow that said Thunder Up. Wow. That's awesome. You know what I mean? Yeah. Seven years old. So when I tell you that, like, we want to see this team succeed. And when you want to see something succeed, there's going to be an amount of frustration that comes along with mm -hmm. it as well. Who's your daughter's favorite player? If you don't mind me asking, I'm just curious. My oldest daughter uh -huh. loves Paul George. Ah. Uh -huh. Loves Paul. Like, I'm to the point where Paul George has replaced daddy on the screen. Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> has replaced daddy on the screensaver. You know, Paul I, George I, is on the screensaver instead of her father. I think it's cool, though, because, uh, I mean, not for you, not being replaced <laughs> by Paul George. She's but, like, I think that's great, but not for you. <laughs> but, to, but to have a, a kid that actually, Paul George is their favorite player, it's always Russell Westbrook, you know? It's right. kind of cool now. Right. You, it, Got to make if he if Paul was here. I'm but sure like, prior cool. to prior to Paul George coming, Russell Westbrook was both my daughter's favorite mm -hmm. player because, like I told you, when I come down here a lot of the time, my wife and my daughters will come as well. Russell, every time he sees them, he takes pictures with them. He gives them, you know all these. Yeah. And, and what's amazing about Russell Westbrook to me is that demeanor that he has on the floor, off the floor. Yeah. That's that's crazy. I was just having a conversation with somebody about how people turn that off. Like, it seems impossible how you could just have that killer instinct and then all of a sudden just be a completely <laughs> super right, nice that guy. Competitive nature, <laughs> like, that competitive nature that comes out of him on that floor. Like mm -hmm. I say, he always plays angry with amnesia. <laughs> but when that game is over and he goes and showers, talks to the media, comes out afterwards, and like every time he's seen me, my wife, and my daughters, like he is just the most generous, hospitable young man you know yeah. hey you might take a picture no yeah for sure let's do it you know what i mean just very very nice and so it's complete opposite of the russell westbrook that the perception of him that is out there on that floor right yeah that's always been so weird to me like because because we see that like a lot of times i mean you'll see like the videos of him shooting around before games and he'll mm -hmm. like you know go hang out with a kid for a second and it's like oh that's really cool but right. like national media never sees that and so they just kind of paint him as this like beast mode guy yeah like, i mean i think it's hard for people to believe that he can be one way on the court and then a completely different way off the court. They just don't want to that, believe that's that. But that's how everybody yeah. is to a certain degree. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? To a, would, when, when you get put in that realm of competition, mm -hmm. you're not going to be the same within that realm of competition as you are when that when the lights go off. You'd and, be an insane person. No question. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. can, you imagine, can you imagine if Russell Westbrook was the same off the floor that he is on the floor? Yeah. No. Oh my Me God. neither. Go grocery shopping with him. And he's just yeah. flying through the lanes. Right. Like, <laughs> I in said front of grab people. the bread. <laughs> like, oh, oh. All right, well, let's shift on to this team as a whole, as a, as the big picture goes. Going to the playoffs. They clinched a spot last night. Mm -hmm. Got the Grizzlies tomorrow night, obviously. Most, most people expect the Thunder to win that game. Um, how do you feel about this team overall right now? Are they gelling to the point where you feel confident? You know, for me, I've felt confident all year once this team got in. Once they got in, on our post-game show, I constantly reiterate the fact that this is a team that's built for the playoffs. And I do mean that. Mm -hmm. right. I do mean that. Right. From, uh, from a number of different areas or a number of different boxes that this team can check that a lot of teams can't. You know, this team can play big and be successful. This team can play small. And be Starting successful. to see that a lot lately. Right. This team can play small and be successful. You have firepower with Russell Westbrook, mm -hmm. Paul George, Carmelo Anthony, now Steven Adams. You have star power yeah. with those guys as well. You have physicality with Steven Adams. So when you're talking about a four to seven game series, there are certain things that will be very difficult to match up with and guard. And Billy Donovan has at his, at his luxury the ability to make changes. So if tall ball is not working, now you can say, you know what, Jeremy Grant, we're going to put you at the five spot like he did against Houston. Right. You know, so you can match up against some of the bigger teams and you can also match up against some of the smaller teams with the same amount of success. Yeah, one of the things that we've seen from Billy so far this year, actually since he's been here, is like he has tried a bunch of different lineups, mm -hmm. which also, you know, probably to get ready for the playoffs, you know, depending on what they're going to see, they've they've tried a, a bunch of different 
options and so almost everything yeah and so that's what he maybe that's what he was building up for but that's really what you have to do as a coach though you don't want to leave any stone unturned mm-hmm. you right. know so you don't want to go into the playoffs thinking well gosh i kind of want to try this guy but i, I can i don't know what he brings yeah. right you've because, never seen him in that situation with right. those guys and now you have so right. you can go all the way down the bench and there's not one guy on that roster where you don't have some memory of them throughout the course of the season making some sort of impact i thought he made a good point i think it was last night he said something along the lines of of talking about his lineups and talking about, well, if I don't try these things, you know, if we're not playing well going into the playoffs, it doesn't matter anyways. And I was like, well, that's true, you know, because if you don't try those things, you might not figure out what works the best. Right. So if you're not playing your best basketball going into the playoffs, then why why does it even matter? What that's that's kind of why he does what he does, I guess. Yeah. And and the thing is, you know, Billy Donovan, people don't give him the credit he deserves mm-hmm. because what happens, like you notice how. This team played extremely well against Houston. This team played extremely well last night. And let's hypothetically say this team goes out tomorrow and plays extremely well. Mm. No one's talking about Billy Donovan. Right. right? Yeah. No one's sure. saying anything yeah. about Billy Donovan and the job that he's done within those three games. Because when teams play well, we praise the players. And when teams struggle, we criticize the coach. <clears throat> but he's made a lot of great moves. If you look at the, the Houston game, actually going with Jeremy Grant and Patrick Patterson down the stretch. No one will say anything about mm-hmm. that. No one yeah, will say yeah, anything right. about Hardly the fact that mention. Jeremy Grant finished that game mm-hmm. at the five. Because what we'll do, we'll praise Jeremy Grant. Not the person who left him in the game. But now, if Jeremy Grant comes out and they lose that game, now everybody's pointing at Billy Donovan like, what? You know, so right. it comes to a point where you have to give coaches the credit that they deserve. No, no coach is perfect. I played for Greg Popovich for four years. Won a championship with him. No coach is perfect. Every coach will make mistakes. That's a part of the NBA life. But just like anything else in life, it's impossible to succeed without failing somewhere along the way. You, yeah, you yeah. have to fail to right, succeed. Yeah. for sure. That's, that's cool. Speaking of, I kind of want to just, you said you mentioned Greg Popovich and I'm interested. What was <laughs> it like playing for him? I mean, I know that's a broad question. Yeah, but. it is. It was, um, it was tough. Yeah. You know, when you're playing for Pop, you have to... First, you have to check your ego at the door, no (laughs) matter how big or small your ego may be. And you have to prepare yourself to be coached. Not about what's right for you as an individual. It's about what's collectively right for that team, that organization, and that community. Right. But there's no totem pole. Mm -hmm. There really is no totem pole. There is no totem pole. When I tell you Tim Duncan got cursed out the same way as the last guy on the bench, it happened. So does that kind of organization, like, I mean, playing in that system, does that make you just every time you're doing anything, like it just makes you like really lock in every possession or is that, is it just kind of. Well, you know what makes you lock in every possession? If you're not locked in, you're held accountable. Right. Mm -hmm. Meaning if you make them, Tim Duncan makes a mistake or David Robinson makes a mistake or Avery Johnson and these are starters and those guys are getting the tongue lashing for missing a rotation or not being where they're supposed to be, you best believe if I'm coming off the bench, I'm not going to make that mis- same mistake and I'm going to be there. Right. You know, so when you're held accountable for what you are doing wrong, that that's what kind of pushes you to that point where it's like, you know what? Okay, I made this mistake. I didn't rotate. I wasn't there ahead of time. I cannot allow this to happen again. Right. Yeah. You know, and Tim Duncan, David Robinson, all those guys kind of set the tone, not just by that, but by the way they responded to Greg Popovich. Because what you see in today, and this, uh, this is generational. Mm. This is generational. What you see now as of what you saw when I was with San Antonio, those guys were cursed out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> cursed out. But they didn't bat an eye. It was, uh, you're, you know what, you're right, Pop, I'll be there next time. Right, there was, so there was never like conflict at, no, on like, their side back. Right, so now if you are coming off that bench, now what you're telling yourself is, man, like he just cursed out Tim Duncan. He's a <laughs> rookie of the year. David Robinson's one of the best players ever play, but they didn't say anything to him. How would it be if, if he get yeah. one at me and I'm coming off the bench? I'm like, well, well, hold on, Pop. Wait a minute, man. You know, <laughs> so it, it just they kind of set the tone for everyone else from from top to bottom. So would you say that's what makes Pop as great as he is? Is the accountability or his ability? That, that's to- a part of it, right? That's a part of it. Another thing that makes him great is his ability to adjust to the times. You so know, so okay. he evolves with oh, the no game question. with no question. Well, it's kind of like the Aldridge thing like this year. Like, yeah, but I'm just talking about just with the, the times, meaning when we played in 1999 and won a championship in 99, the game was played inside out. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. We weren't taking shots without Tim Duncan or David Robinson touching the ball. So that game went from David Robinson and Tim Duncan to Tim Duncan to Tim Duncan, Manu Ginobili, <laughs> Tony Parker. 
to Manu, Tony, and now Kawhi Leonard. Mm -hmm. So just his ability to basically evolve as a coach, understanding mm -hmm. that times are changing. You think of any coach in this league that has evolved with the times, with the amount of success as he has. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, there's not no one. That's one. not easy to there's, do. I don't think there is one. Right. Yeah. That's Because usually you get a coach and – I play for coaches like this. They're not a coach one way. Mm -hmm. They coach one way. So if right. the game changes, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if the game changes, you're in trouble. You have and, to provide them with a certain roster. Right. And, exactly. Yeah. And, and Pop is not that guy. Pop is not that guy. He understands how to get the best out of whoever is on that roster at that time. You know? I, how much in NBA coaching is, how, how do you weigh out ego management and X's and O's? <laughs> Honestly, it's probably 99% ego management. Really? Wow. It's 99% <clears throat> ego management. Because you have to understand, when guys are drafted to the NBA, there is no one that is coming. It's very rare, I should say, that a guy is being drafted to the NBA that's coming from being a role player. Yeah, they're always the best person. They've been, <laughs> they've been the best you go. since they were a child. That's exactly right. right. And you've won. Been, right, yeah. exactly. You've won. <laughs> you've had success and, and all these other things that come along with being and getting to that point mm. where one in every a million get a chance to make it. But then once you get there, things change. You know, so there are the, the ebb and flows of a career. There are the ebb and flows of a season of ego of, well, okay, well, now I'm not the man anymore. You know, when I was at Bowling Green, I was, whatever, sixth in the country in score and fourth in assist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you go to Vancouver and you realize guys are bigger, stronger, faster, smarter, more explosive than anything that you've ever dealt with. And now you have to adjust because you can't do the same things that you did in college. That's why the coaching staffs are so big. Mm -hmm. Because the coach's <laughs> job, the head coach's <laughs> job is to manage egos. You know, and you have certain guys that are on your bench whose job is to manage ego. So you'll see the assistant coach walking up and down like, you all right, you know, you good. You did a great job, so on and so forth. And then you have other guys that are there for X's and O's. Mm -hmm. Certain guys are offensive coach, right. defensive minds. You know, like you got, have guys like Thibs, you know, in Minnesota, who was a heck of a defensive coach for Doc Rivers when they won the championship. You know, you have guys right. like that. So it's really kind of spread out throughout your coaching staff. You want someone that can bring – something in particular to to your coaching staff. Mm -hmm. You're kind of seeing the ego management thing with the Thunder this year. Are you not? I mean, you have, Carm like you said, all these superstars, you know, in their careers, Carmelo Anthony, Paul George, Russell Westbrook. Now you got Steven Adams on the rise. You got these guys that have been there, done that. That's got to be a big... I mean, that's a new thing for Billy Donovan. <laughs> that's a new thing for everybody. Yeah, yeah That's right. a new thing for Russell Westbrook. Right. It's a new thing for Paul George. a new thing for Carmelo Anthony. And... I think a great example of how difficult it is to get stars to actually play together and succeed and to kind of leave your ego at the door if you look at what just happened in Cleveland. All right. Look at what just happened mm -hmm. in Cleveland. You have LeBron James, who's the best player on the planet right, right now. Derrick Rose, who's a former MVP. Dwayne Wade, who's a three-time champion. And Isaiah Thomas, who was in the MVP conversation this past year. Along with Kevin Love, who's won the championship. Tristan Thompson, who's won the championship. J.R. Smith, who's won the championship. So you put all these together and say, you know what? Let's go. Let's make it work. <laughs> that is easier said than done. Did you see that coming before the season? No, I'm not going to say I did. Yeah. No, I, I'm not, I, I will definitely not say I saw that coming, but it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, yeah like once it happens, it's like, right. well, run. Yeah, I can yeah, see that. Like, yeah, yeah, I can, <laughs> well, you know, I can see, I can see this happening. It, it really didn't surprise me because the amount of egos that you have there. And you're asking guys to do something they've never had to do. You know, so you're mm. asking guys to take a back seat when they've never had to take a back seat. So is that is that kind of what we're seeing with the Thunder right now? Like, the th I think most people had the Thunder winning more games than they than mm -hmm. they have so far this year. So are we just seeing a little bit of some growing pains a no little question. bit? And that's no question. What no, if you go back and look at the Miami Heat when LeBron James first got there, when he first got there with Dwayne Wade and with Chris Bosh, it was not all sweet. Mm -hmm. It was <laughs> not all sweet. You know, it, it took a, and I know fans hate to hear this because <laughs> we live in a microwave society where we want things so quick. It's going to take a minute. It is going to take a minute. And because Paul George is a free agent, yeah, we want that minute to be now. Right. That's, I think that's kind of the pressure is, you know, it's like, well, I thought a minute was going to be like all-star break. And, and but you think about all-star break, it's only 50 games. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's only 50 games, you know. And for me, I wanted this team to get here. 
I wanted this team to get here to see, because the ceiling of this team is incredible to me. It's incredible. The potential that this team has is incredible to me. So once you get to the playoffs and really see what this team can become, now you move forward from there. So you believe this team has what it takes on this roster to knock off a of Golden State, I do. knock off a of Houston? I do. For for a four, it's not going to be easy. Mm-hmm. But winning championships isn't easy. So so is is the lack of consistency just the? Is it simplify? If you, can you simplify it saying, well, this is a new group. It's tough to be consistent. Or can you say, well, there's been times that they haven't put forth the energy that they need to put forth. Or do those things kind of bleed into one another? Well, I, I think sometimes. And this is something that comes along with star power. Mm -hmm. Is you can become complacent and feel like your star power can get you out of any situation. You know, so if you're Cleveland, you can think to yourself, like, you know what, man, let's go out and hoop. We get down by 10 or 15. We got enough guys that can put the ball in the basket. We can offense our way back in the game. Just like a kind of a LeBron will do it. Right. (laughs) Right. Or or an Isaiah Thomas that believes in himself because he averaged 30 points a game. Or Derrick Rose, who is the youngest MVP ever, that believes in himself. So you're constantly thinking that. And in this league, TV does not give guys or do guys justice for how good they really are. Yeah. How fast they really are, how strong they really are, how well they can shoot the basketball. Because when you're sitting there and watching at home and understanding how good these guys are, it does not give them justice. So if you're talking about the Brooklyn's, the the Mavericks and, you know, some of these other quote unquote tanking teams, they may not have the talent, but they are going to go out and play extremely hard. You've seen it a lot this year. No question. Uh, against the Thunder, you know, if if you take those teams lightly, they're not taking you lightly, no, especially no, now. No yeah, question. I mean, I mean, these are guys trying to get contracts and trying to make a living, so they're not going to just go out and suck. Th- these are guys <laughs> like, that yeah, these are guys that aren't signed for the next 5 years. Yeah. These are guys yeah. that are signed for the remainder of the season. So when you're going out and you're playing, you're auditioning for all 30 teams, all 29 teams outside of the team that you're actually playing for. Yeah, so if ownership wants to lose, that doesn't mean anything to you. No, tanking doesn't <laughs> yeah. exist amongst players. Yeah, no, no It does not. You know, tanking may exist in the front office, in certain front offices, where they're going to try and put you in a position to fail. Mm-hmm. But you don't get to that point of being an NBA basketball player without having one heck of a competitive nature. Yeah. So you're not going to go out there and say, like yesterday, playing Miami. Miami, of course Miami wants to finish in seventh because you want to face Boston first round. Right. But you think they're going to go out there and lay down? Yeah. Like, oh, man, I don't really feel like playing it. Hey, look, let's go on the 18 run to start the game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then let's just put on cruise control after that. No, guys are going to go out and they're going to compete. That's what guys do. That's what have got guys to the point where they are. Are you worried about not having Robertson in the, in this postseason and what you might lose by not having him, how much of a blow is that to this team? Huge. It's a huge blow because of there are certain things that guys bring that don't show up on the stat sheet that are extremely contagious. Extremely contagious. Mm-hmm. And one thing that Andre brought every game, I, I don't care how he was shooting the basketball, how he was shooting free throws, irrelevant to me. One thing that was consistent with him is you knew that he was going to go out and do what? And do the dirty plays. Play defense? There you go. 50-50 balls. He was going to defend. He was going to go out and defend. And as far as his offense goes, this is where the blow came for me. Billy Donovan learned where to put him in with Paul George, with Carmelo Anthony, Russell Westbrook, and Steven Adams so all those five could play well together. So now when you take that piece out, now you have to plug a new piece in. Terrence Ferguson, Alex Abrinas, Josh Eustace, those guys bring, each one brings something different, but they're not quite ready yet. Right. Not quite ready yet. That's why I love the addition of Corey Brewer. Mm -hmm. Because you're getting a guy who's seasoned, who's been there, and that can bring some of the same similar characteristics that Andre brought to the table. I would be, see, for me, it, it kills me when somebody gets hurt and then we say, ah, oh, no, it's not that big of a deal. No, because what that does is downplay his impact. You know what I mean? Especially no. his. Right, right. right. You know, and, and Andre was, was a heck of a contributor to the success of this team. He had a real shot, I think. I mean, maybe this is... He did. Maybe this is now how everyone's looking at it after he goes down and they see the drop-off defensively, mm-hmm. but I think he had a real shot at Defensive Player of the Year this year. And he's up there. There's, n- I don't think you can make an argument that he's not a top three perimeter defender in the league right now. Right. He's, he's, and, and, and this is what you're missing. 
you have Paul George on one wing and right. Andre on the other wing. Yeah. And, and and that defensive intensity, no matter what you're bringing offensively, is contagious. You cannot tell me watching that Houston Rockets game the other day to watch Russell Westbrook sit down on James Harden the way he did is not Ooh. contagious. <clears throat> Yeah, and I think that's the biggest part that people didn't realize. Like you, you see Robertson going out and whatever. People look at you know seven points a game or whatever it is, and that's kind of what they focus on. But then you think about it, like on the defensive end, he takes away the best perimeter offensive player on the other team. Well, now you have to shift that to Paul George or like Russ did with Harden. But you have to shift everybody down. And so it's then, a trickle down effect. Yeah, so then you're losing, yeah, and, and kind of what you said, you're, you're trying to fill some voids with Ferguson. I mean, you're just trying to plug guys in, but it's just not that easy. You it, just can't do that. It's, it's not, and each guy brings something different. Obviously, Josh Eustace is going to bring some athleticism and some energy plays here and there. Alex Abrindis' ability to shoot the basketball and stretch the floor, and Terrence Ferguson's youth, and, and the fact that he's naive and athleticism, sometimes that works for mm-hmm. you. Because you don't know any better. Like, I mean, you know what, man? Let me just go out here and hoop. <laughs> you know? so, so that's great. But when you have a guy like Corey Brew who has that relationship with Billy Donovan, now once you bring him in, it's, it's smooth sailing. Corey Brewer makes his team faster. His ability to get out on the break, to make the defense run and get back. So you see Russell Westbrook pushing the ball or Paul George pushing the ball. And Corey Brewer always seems like he's ahead of everybody yeah. else. Yeah. yeah, I actually think, you know, we've talked about it on our podcast a lot, how – no one really expected Corey Brewer to come in and make the impact that he's actually made. And one thing this team's been lacking, and everyone thought coming into the season, this team was going to be just deadly in transition on the fast break because what are you going to do? You got Paul George, uh, Russell Westbrook. We're kind of learning that Paul George doesn't really keep up with Russ as, as well as we kind of thought he would. It's not easy to do, though. Yeah, it's yeah. not you easy think, to do. You got to understand what you're asking. Right. <laughs> right. No, no doubt about it. But it's, that's what amazes me about Corey Brewer, that he can and sometimes it seems like he's faster than Russ. Right. How? Yeah, Corey Brewer has like that that PlayStation 4 X button <laughs> yeah. where you just hold down the turbo <laughs> right. and, you just, and it just doesn't run out. You know, he's just back and forth and back and forth, mm-hmm. but that's needed. You know, Definitely. his ability to get up and down the floor because what that does is that gets everybody running and gets Russ in his wheelhouse. His wheelhouse is pushing the basketball, pushing the pace, giving him an opportunity to get downhill for himself or for someone else. Mm -hmm. You know, you see Carmelo Anthony shooting more threes down never because he's running and trailing the play. If Russ is collapsing the defense, now you know where Melo's going to be. And that's what I'm saying why it takes time. And you can see Russ and Carmelo and Russ and Paul George and Russ and Steven Adams have always had that that connection just just certain things certain plays that continue to to show themselves game at the game and that's where that chemistry is starting to develop and so you talked about we or we talked a little bit about having to plug guys in so mm-hmm. where's your confidence level on how how many how many guys are actually going to see time in the playoffs do you think billy is going to keep uh, an expanded rotation do you think it will sort of get smaller like a lot of teams do you know for me honestly i i hate I don't like to say hate. My daughter hates when I say that. I'm sorry. I dislike. <laughs> <laughs> I dislike saying what I think the culture do. I have no idea. Yeah. I'm being honest. I have no idea. I, I think everything is matchup pending. Mm. <laughs> you know, if you play certain teams, maybe you only go nine deep. You know, you have your starting five, and maybe you only go Raymond Felton, Patrick Patterson, um, Jeremy Grant, and maybe Alex Sabrinas. Maybe. Yeah. You know, but when you start talking about the playoffs, what I'm used to, what I've dealt with when I played was a shortened rotation. You do have a shortened rotation. And you can see the rotation slowly but surely getting Mm -hmm. a little smaller now. Yesterday, Terrence Ferguson got in because Alex Sabrinas, you know, had that hit. Right, took that hit to the head. So, and if Terrence Ferguson doesn't play yesterday, what is that, a nine nine man rotation? I'm missing Patrick Patterson. Mm-hmm. I mentioned Patrick Patterson. So maybe it may be a nine man rotation, you know, depending. That's what they played in Houston, too, nine right. guys. So it kind of seems like they're kind of gearing up that way. We talked a lot about how, you know, the adjustment period that this team's had to go through with Mello, or, you know, Mello, Russ, Paul George, all these new guys. Is there any validity to it? Might take a little more time to adapt to a guy like Russell Westbrook. He's not your traditional point guard, obviously. I, I don't, I hate that term because that's not a well, thing. It's positionless anymore. basketball now. Yeah, yeah. yeah but. Mm-hmm. Just the way he plays is is different than anyone we've ever seen, mm-hmm. right? So, is there any is it valid to say that it's 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 a little difficult as a perimeter player to adapt to him sometimes? Is that fair to say? I I, I don't know. I mean, I I think what would be difficult, and and the thing is, I can't relate to Carmelo, Paul George, and Russell Westbrook because I was never a star. Mm-hmm. But I can tell you what stars are used to. Stars are used to having a basketball in their hands. 
So when I say it's an adjustment for not just Paul George and Carmelo Anthony, it's an adjustment for Russell Westbrook as well. Yeah. You know, and one thing I don't think Billy Donovan gets enough credit for is understanding how to stagger guys' minutes to get the best out of all. You know, understanding playing Paul George with that second unit because maybe playing that first unit with Russ, he doesn't have the his usage rate is not as high. So now you get Russell Westbrook out the game for his rest, and now you get Paul George an opportunity to handle the ball more. Similar to what Mike D'Antoni does in Houston with Chris Paul and James Harden. You know, when you have those two guys on the floor together, their usage rate will be cut in half because one of them has the ball and one doesn't. But then when Chris Paul goes out the game, now the ball's in James Harden's hands. Mm. Then when James Harden goes out the game, now the ball's in Chris Paul's hands. So you give credit to coaches when they understand how to stagger guys, stagger guys' minutes, knowing how to get the best out of both. And when things take time as players, so we, we've said that a couple of times today, like it's going to take a minute, it's going to take a minute. It takes a minute from a coach as well. You know, you don't come in and just say, you know what, you guys, you guys go out there and y'all hoop and y'all figure it out. <laughs> That's not how it works. <laughs> yeah. You know, you have to put guys in a position to be successful, mainly your stars. Because once your stars feel comfortable, everybody around them can kind of fit in. Okay, now you see Steven Adams understanding that he's going to have that, that room to roll down the middle. Now he's going to be open. You know, right. or Jeremy Grant understands where to put himself in the dunker position where he can just catch and dunk and catch and finish. Or Patrick Patterson understands, you know what, when I'm on the floor with these guys, I need to put myself in the corner. So when I say it's going to take time, it takes time all the way across the board. Not just with Billy Donovan and the coaching staff, not just with Russell Westbrook, Paul George, and Carmelo Anthony, but with everyone. Makes sense. We talked about the bench. We talked about the rotation. Jeremy Grant. Now mm. this guy... You don't often see a guy just, especially a young guy, just improve drastically over the course of a season. Tell us how impressive that is in your eyes. This Jeremy Grant looks like a completely different player this year. And I think a lot of that, obviously, he has put in the time, he has put in the work, and he is slowly but surely perfecting his craft. Mm -hmm. You get to the game early, all the things that you see him doing during the game, outside of dunking the basketball, you see him doing. You know, as far as shots, um, t tough angling shots. Yeah. He's working on his three-point shot. He's working on his jump shot. He's working on his ball handling. He's working on his free throw. All these things that we have seen pay dividends. You get to the game an hour, hour and a half before, he is out there doing those things. And what I like about what he brings to this team that no one else can bring, and I said this yesterday on the show, think of any player in the league that you would throw in this category. Give me one guy in the league that rim protects both ways. Meaning, one, they block shots, and two, they take charges. Oh, yeah. Guys are really good at one or the other. Yeah. You so, really guys see both. are really good. DeAndre Jordan's a heck of a shot blocker. Rudy Gobert is a heck of a shot blocker. Yeah. You have guys in this league. Anthony Davis, a heck of a shot blocker. Mm -hmm. Give me somebody else in the league that's good at both. What's cool about Grant, too, is when he's taking his charges, oftentimes he's guarding the ball. Right. Yeah. Him, so, and, him and Manu Ginobili, I think, are the best in the league at that. I don't know how he does it, but he's so good at it. Yeah. You kind of just expect him to get the call now yeah. at that point. But Yeah, there, there was like a time the other day he did, and I was like, what? That's, well, what do you mean? That doesn't make do sense. Yeah. <laughs> you can't do that. Jeremy Grant, I think, is easily the most improved player on this team, which I didn't, mm, I didn't really— think? I think so. Yeah. Do you not? Is there somebody Steven? else you have in mind? No. Oh. It could be. No. Well, how much of that? How much of that is attributed to the new guys? No question. Yeah. I, I've said from day one. I thought you brought as far as Stephen Adams. Yeah. I, I thought from day one. I've always said Stephen Adams will be the biggest beneficiary yeah. of having Carmelo Anthony and Paul George because that gives him exactly what he needs: room, right, space. Because it's like last year he was just crowded right. all because the time. Because what what teams are daring guys to do last year is shoot. Right. So they're not going to allow Russell Westbrook and Steven Adams to continue to connect in that five to ten foot area. No. What you do is you kick it out for three and hope those guys hit it right. and live with it. You're not living with Paul George yeah. out there shooting threes. You're not living with Carmelo Anthony out there shooting threes. What teams are saying is, you know what, Steven Adams, if you can hit that five to seven foot floater, that's something we're going to live with. And he has improved, and he is knocking that shot down yeah, with regularity. It's, it's crazy how sort of automatic that seems to be. Mm -hmm. But in terms of Jeremy Grant, I just think – like, you look at kind of what he was expected to be this season. Like, he was – there is so much required of him whenever you get rid of Ennis Cantor. Like, you you need somebody else to be able to step up in that backup, backup center role. And 
like Grant, who is going to be undersized against quite a few centers in this league. Mm-hmm. Like the fact that he's able to hold his own is incredible to me. And, and what he's learned to do is he's undersized on one side of the floor, but on the other side of the floor, he has an offensive advantage. Yeah. Right. right. You know, so his size on one side of the floor, his ability to get off the ground and his defensive IQ can make up for a lot of mistakes. But on the other end, you're talking about some of these guys who are not used to guarding fives that may step out to 10, 15 feet and shoot it. And if not shoot it, put the ball on the floor and be able to contort his body right. and get to the rim the way he does. That's unheard of at that five position. Well, and his ability lately to get fouled has just boggled yeah. my mind. Like yeah. he's gotten incredibly he's a good tough at that. matchup. And his yeah. free throws are drastically improving. Yeah. Right. He's, he's getting starting it, to make what them. Area or, of his not drastically, game, but steadily. What area of his game has he not improved in? That's a great question. I mean, I guess the only thing you could say from last season would be three-point shooting. It's fallen off a little bit, but the thing is he's made up for it totally by attacking the basket repeatedly. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you can't... Guys might not even respect his three-point shot and might lay off six, seven feet, and he still finds a way to get to the basket. Right. It's impressive. Right. That's that's learning. That's learning on the fly. You know, and that's not settling either. Just Mm -hmm. because a guy gives you a wide-open shot doesn't or backs off you sometimes we call it in pickup ball don't bail that guy out you know if a guy knows he can't guard you he's going to back all the way up and say oh, i dare you to shoot it yeah no what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna attack your feet and see if you can move and stay with <laughs> yeah, me. yeah you know so that's just kind of learning on the fly it's crazy it is he's become a, a go-to guy for this team you can give him the ball with seven seconds on the shot clock and say get us a bucket and he can do that right or you. get to the line yeah or get right. to the line. And you need those guys you need those guys you know because the defense will key in on a russell westbrook Defense is going to key in on Paul George or that Russell Westbrook, Stephen Adams pick and roll. So you need guys that will, one, that can create shots, get to the rim, create free throws. Also, guys that can keep basketballs alive, give you two or three opportunities and make energy plays. Jeremy is that guy. And like you said, if he's on the court with Paul George, Melo, and Russ, he's likely in a, in a mismatch. He, whoever's guarding Jeremy Grant probably can't guard him. Right. Because they're guarding those other guys. <laughs> right. Yeah, so it's not like you're going to put your best defender on him. Yeah. But he found yeah. a way. He Like I, I, told, um, I told somebody the other day, Jeremy Grant has find, found a way to, to use and harness all that athleticism that the Lord blessed him with. You see some kids right now that are just incredible athletes but just don't understand how to play. He's got it in his blood, too. Yeah, he does. <laughs> yeah. Jeremy Grant is one heck of an athlete that is really learning how to use his athleticism to his advantage. Outside of Jeremy Grant, who else on this team can you see being a true X factor in the playoffs? See, and, and I, I don't think he's an X factor anymore. But Steven you just Adams. rely on him at this Steven point? Steven Adams. Steven Adams. He's and, the guy. And, yes, incredibly incredibly important what he brings to this team is and you can say it's a lot of things that don't show up on stat sheets but it's a lot of things that do show up (laughs) on stat sheets too right you know his ability to keep basketballs alive because he does something that you have to scout and prepare for if you remember Dennis Rodman one of the things Dennis Rodman was great at was rebounding offensive rebounding and what that does is give Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen Steve Kerr, John Paxson, Tony Kukoc, all these guys, more opportunities to score. You have to face guard him. If you're face guarding him to keep him off the offensive glass, that gives Russell Westbrook room. That Mm -hmm. that, That takes another player out where a year ago they may have zoned on someone. You know, when I say this team is built for the playoffs, all the things that we're talking about is what I'm referring to. Yeah. And, and in the playoffs, you see a lot more of those. Uh, obviously, the game slows down. So guys like Steven Adams, I mean, he can thrive down there, right? right. And, and he gives you two or three possessions, one, and he's improved his footwork to the point where you can actually go to him on the box. Do you think that's underused? Do you think they should kind of go to that more often? Yeah, my, my thing is I, I, don't, I don't like when games go along. Like, I, I forgot what the stat was. And Steven Adams is averaging close to 10 points a game in the first quarter. Right, and then he just... Right. So I don't like when the game goes along and he's that forgotten man. He's too good to be forgotten. Right, yeah. You know, he's too good to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. Um, This team is successful when he's successful. When he is a valued part of this offense, whether it's the fact that you're going to him or he's keeping basketballs alive or catching lobs or catching that little floater that we talked about earlier, tip-ins, whatever it may be, this team is different. This team has a completely different mentality about them as far as their physicality is concerned when Steven Adams is a big-time piece of that offense. 
Definitely. I think you can, you can almost throw it back to when Ibaka was here. And when they got Ibaka going early in the offense, it seemed to change who he was throughout the course That's of the game. That's every big man, though. Really? That's every big man. Uh, you, for big man, if you give them the ball, there's nothing they won't do for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As a guard, I used to pass up shots to give other guys shots because I know when it came down to it, those guys will cover your mistakes. They will run for you. They will screen for you. They will fight for you. They will do whatever they have to do for you because that's it's a it's a partnership. It's a marriage. My job as a guard is to keep the big happy. The big's job as a big is to protect the guard. That's the way it works. And bigs will screen like crazy because they understand the better the screen, they're probably going to end up with the shot. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so it, it's a marriage. It's a partnership that's going on. And you can see that marriage and partnership with Russell Westbrook and, and Steven Adams. Definitely. The chemistry that they've built. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. I mean, obviously, I think they're first in, in the NBA in that's assists. Yeah. In assists as a, as a duo. Uh, Russ to Adams mm -hmm. leads the NBA. And that's pretty crazy considering, what, he scores 12, 13 points a game. And he's right. he's at the top of that. So right. that shows you the chemistry right there. All right, before we get to some questions that we got for you, we're going to rapid fire some questions. Oh, man. I want to get what, uh, what, what kind of sense you get from Paul George. Just don't. How he's doing. I, I can't. You, I don't. You don't want to go here? Not no, no, I'm not saying I don't want to go there. I, I, I don't. I, I don't get a sense. Yeah. Like, do you think he just, he doesn't know? Yeah. I, like, the thing how hard is, how is that going you, through though? a season without? It's tough. It's tough. You know, when I was with Seattle, when I was with Seattle, Nate McMillan told us the first game of the season. And we had, this was a year where we had like nine free agents. The whole coaching staff was free agents. The training staff was free agents. Ooh. Everybody. And his thing was, you know what? I don't want nobody talking about free agency until the season's over. And no one talked about free mm -hmm. agency until the season was over. We had a very successful year. Won 52 games, lost to San Antonio in the second round of the playoffs when we weren't supposed to win anything. Nate McMillan won coach of the year. We was picked last in our division. Oh, wow. Who was on that team? Just out of curiosity. Ray Allen. Ray Allen, Rashard, Rashard Lewis, Lewis. Uh, Reggie Evans, Jerome James, Luke Rittenauer, Nick Collison. Oh, yes. yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, really great. It was a great season. Mm -hmm. Vladimir Radmanovich. And it weighs on you. It does weigh on you. Yeah. Because... This is your life. This is your life. And as much as we would like to say, you know, oh man, you know what? Don't worry about it. Just go hoop. That's easier said than done. Like we talked about when we first started this podcast. Guys are human. Yeah. Right. Guys are human. You can't you know? not think about you it. You can't not think about <laughs> what's next. You're also getting questions constantly. It's yeah. something that that the media is going to constantly ask right. you about. And so you you're you can't always put it behind you because it's always being the brought up. The moment it's behind you is brought back up. Right. right. You know, it's like, okay, gosh, I don't have to think about this for a while. Then All-Star Games in L.A. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's Everyone's like, like, all right, well, oh, Paul, it? hey. Right, let's talk about this. <laughs> then you come back home for a couple of days, and you play in L.A. <laughs> oh, my goodness, great. So it's just, it's constantly, it's constantly going to be there. And I don't, no, I don't think anyone has a sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't know. I haven't talked to Paul George about it. Nothing of the sort. No one in his organization have I spoke to about it. But I'll be hard pressed to think if he has any idea what he's doing right now. Yeah, yeah, I think right. Jason's right. I, yeah, I like, how even... could you? Right, have it's the second week of mind. April. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the second week of April, and free agency doesn't start till July. Right. It's a good thing. Uh, I think the Thunder have really handled the whole thing really well, though. I will say that just upon like going from his arrival to the party they threw for him, yeah, to just kind of how they've not talked about free agency the entire time. They've mm -hmm. kept it out of the locker room. They've. Ru Apparently, Russell and, and Paul have built this camaraderie amongst them, and, and Melo, obviously. Mm -hmm. So, th you know, things are going good this season, but like you said, he's a human. It's and his life. It's he's saying all of the right things, especially right now. Mm -hmm. You know, he was he's the one that is saying, like, it's not just for one season. It takes longer than one right. season to get this going. So that's awesome. To, that's something that's great to, to hear, but it still could mean <laughs> nothing. Hopefully it doesn't, but we'll see. So You, have, you never know. Yeah. You know, it, it's... <laughs> I, I don't know, man. That that that's a toughie. You that's can, a toughie. We go, but I go back and forth like every other day on it. <laughs> <laughs> Just complete panic, or <laughs> yeah. like he's yeah. staying. He's leaving. No, he's staying. Brandon, he's leaving. Brandon okay. has a bet going right no, now. Yeah, a bet. Oh yeah, but he might, have to, get a, he might have to get a tattoo. I don't of think some he's sort. staying. Okay. And, and so basically, I'm. We haven't decided what I'm going to pay off if he does stay, but I'm going to do something. And you know, I'll, be, I'll gladly do okay, it if he stays. But before y'all give me the the rapid fire questions, you have to give me some explanation as to why Ooh. Uh, just for fun um no 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 no, no oh, well, why do you think he's leaving say, why do want, i yeah. why do i think he's leaving you know i i feel like his heart's at home 
And uh, this is just totally... Everybody's like, heart's at home, though. <laughs> sure, but I feel like that's where maybe... I feel like there's too much smoke there in, in the history. That I feel, you know, going back to last year when it came out that he wanted to be in L.A., I feel like there's just so much there. And as it's... This season hasn't gone quite as good as everyone hoped it... But it's, it's not over yet, so mm-hmm. you never know what can happen. Right. But it hasn't gone quite as good as he'd hoped. He hasn't even had his best season. And I just get that sense that... He, he wants to be in L.A. That's kind of just what I, the feeling that I get. Mm. It, it's nothing more than that. It's, it's not that I've heard him say right, something. Right, that's what I'm saying. No one, no one really knows. Yeah. I just no really one, hope. And my, my thought process about free agency as a whole, you can talk about LeBron James. Like for me, maybe I'm wrong. I think LeBron's staying in Cleveland. I'm kind of yeah. with you. I'm I with think. you on that. Why? Because there's nothing for him elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, it doesn't seem like there would be. So if you could talk to LeBron, would you tell him, stay in the East, obviously? Like, (laughs) Like, hey, 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 LeBron James, sit down, man. Let's go. (laughs) Let's discuss free agency. (laughs) Let's discuss free agency. Here's my thing with LeBron. His words, not mine. I'm chasing the goat. Which is Michael Jordan, which basically is another way of saying... I'm chasing championships because right. anytime you use and you compare LeBron James and Michael Jordan, what people will tell you separates the two is Michael has been there six times and he's won six. Mm-hmm. Right. LeBron has three. I get it. If you're chasing championships, going to LA and playing with Kyle Kuzma, Lonzo Ball and Brandon <laughs> Ingram is not getting you any closer to a championship. Exactly. And it's putting you in the West where you're playing against Oklahoma City and Houston and Golden State and San Antonio. So not only does it put you further away from a championship, it puts you further away from the finals. Right. You could Tougher be, road, you for could sure. Be for sure. Sitting in uh, three through eight in the playoffs and right. not know where you're going. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let's do this. What do you say? Let's do it. Got some questions here. I'm going to start. We were going to ask you this anyways. This actually isn't part of the question. But do you have an idea? What's the best matchup for the Thunder in the first round? I don't. I don't. Doesn't no. matter? For, no. No. Doesn't matter. I, I'm, I'm excited about... You really are in that locker room because that's what they say. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> because for me, I, I, honestly, I honestly feel this way. And I'm being honest. This team can beat anyone. This team can beat anyone. I have said on our show numerous times, their best is good enough to beat anybody in the NBA. But their worst is wor- bad enough to lose to any team. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? But so, that's any team's worst probably, wouldn't you say? Well... well to lose to any team in the NBA? I mean, because they're NBA players. But everybody's best isn't good enough to beat any team in the NBA either. You don't think so? There, no. There are a lot of teams in this league that can play really good and not beat Golden State by 15, yeah. not beat Golden State by 20, not go to Houston and beat a team that hasn't lost at home since January. Mm. You know, there's a lot of teams in this league whose best can't get that accomplished. What you have in this team is a team whose best really, and you mean this when you say this, this team at their best Firing on all cylinders. And that's why I think that there's a there's a silent confidence that comes along with them. You know, and sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes that's a bad thing. Because that silent confidence at times when you're playing the Brooklyns and the Sacramentos, that silent confidence will get you beat. Yeah. Right. Kind of it's them. a right, it's a different mentality when you're in the playoffs and you're because now you're done with the 50 lost teams. You yeah. don't have to worry about the mentality that you have coming out against some of these teams that aren't on the same tier as you. Now, everybody you're playing is on the same tier as you. So the last thing that you have to worry about this Thunder team doing is coming out with the wrong mentality. Makes sense. All right, next. Outside of being away from your family, what is the most challenging or difficult part of your job? Is the fact that I have no control over what goes on on that court. <laughs> you miss it so much? <laughs> yes, that, that, that's the worst. That's the worst. Like I have, I have no control over anything. Right. Like I basically have to sit there and watch. Whether it's a missed free throw, it's turnover, Russell Westbrook hitting a shot at the buzzer, whatever it may be. You know, last night at the end of the show, I, I at the beginning of the show, I screamed because it was like... <laughs> that was hilarious. It was like, like, yes. You they know finally what I mean? did like, it. Yes. <laughs> like, okay, over. you're here. Now let's go ahead and take care of business. Right. And win. So it, it's just the fact that you're, you're invested. You want to see this team succeed. I think Sam Presti is great as a great GM. I think he is a great GM in putting the pieces of this puzzle together. Whether or not the fans have the patience to watch this come together right. is different. But just not being able to have any impact whatsoever and just kind of sit back and watch it. So you mentioned free throws for a second. What do you think is the deal with this team in free throws this well, year? Is the, it, is the it just... Throw, it's mental with everyone. Just, 
with everyone. You know, I, I, no matter who you're talking about, if you're a bad free throw shooter, it, it's mental. It's right. not just mechanics. And, you know, when you talk about bad free throw shooters, whether it's like a Shaquille O'Neal or Andre Drummond or some of these other guys, people say, what well, they don't work on it. If you understood how much these guys actually work on their free throws in comparison to someone who's a great free throw shooter. It's incredible. <laughs> like these guys will say after and shoot hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of free throws. So it's not physical. Right. It's more mental than it is anything so else. How contagious is it whenever you see a guy like Russ who was you know, shooting so well throughout his career, then he's having a down year. Well, the whole team is kind of struggling. The Thunder are one of the worst free throw shooting teams this year. So I wonder how contagious is that whenever you have one guy who's sort of struggling, does it? You know what I'm hoping? Long? I'm hoping when Saturday or Sunday comes and the playoff starts, it's a clean slate. I agree. I feel like that's how they'll treat it. The yeah. way this team talks about themselves and the way they seem to approach everything, that makes sense that they would they would approach it that same way. Yeah, so it's like everything that happened in the regular season happened. And kind of looking in the rearview mirror, whether good or bad, you, you got to put it behind you. You know, I, I ain't going to lie. That's how I used to approach the playoffs. Mm-hmm. So I used to approach the playoffs, you know, you can come in playing really bad. You come out of your first playoff game and you're five and five from the line and, you know, eight and nine from the field, eight to 10 from the field. So now you go back and look like I'm shooting 80% from the field, 100% from the free throw. I'm amazing. So right, I'm amazing. I did this. So, so it, it's like a, it, it's, it is, it's, it's like a clean state slate where all your statistical categories basically reset. So uh, speaking of the playoffs, on that championship Spurs team, did you guys, did you feel like the whole year you were like, this is kind of different, like we kind of have it, or was it just you like know, towards the end of the year where you're like, oh, this you is special? Know what? That year, and NBA TV constantly plays this, they're, they're doing a series that's called What If. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A series that's called What If. And one of the what ifs that they talked about is what if Greg Popovich got fired that year. I saw that one. And I did a lot of interview on that with NBA TV. And you don't understand how close Pop was to getting fired. Why? I, I'm missing something. Because we struggled. No, I forgot about we that. We really? struggled. Yeah. That, and that's why when I say it takes a minute, I'm not just speaking because it's what sounds great. I'm mm-hmm. speaking because that's what I experienced. So in San Antonio, my, my first year there, Tim's second year there. So he got drafted. And this was 98-99. We got off to a rough start. And our in Houston, in Houston, we are on the bus. Everybody gets off the bus. Avery Johnson stands up and we he gives like this huge pep talk. You know, as far as, you know, what do we need to do? Why are we playing this way? Blah, blah, blah. Guys are calling each other out. You know, you need to get tougher. You need to do this. You need to do that. So on and so forth. That discussion right there on that bus changed the whole direction of our entire season. Like a players only meeting. It was. Yeah. But this is prior to social media. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not like something. It didn't get where, announced. Right. It, it didn't get announced. It wasn't going out over Twitter or going out over Facebook or Instagram. It's just something that we had. And because the thought from our all of us that were on that gym was, you know what? If we don't win this game tonight in Houston, Pop will probably get fired. Wow. That was our thought process. And it's you almost, think you guys kind of started playing like this is for him, like to keep well, him. Well, I mean, it was just we were also playing for us. Right. You know, it's like, God, Lee, man, we are we have everything we need in this locker room. You know, all all the boxes are checked, but something's not adding up. Right. You know, we had size, we had Tim, we had Dave, we had veteran experience with Mario Ellie and Steve Kerr and Jerome Kersey and Terry, you know, all these other guys that had been there before. But something wasn't something wasn't working. And it took a, a, I don't really call it a team meeting, meeting, maybe an accountability meeting. <laughs> you know what I mean? And from that point on, things started to change. We, we started to make winning plays. Things started to go our way down the stretch. You know, mm-hmm. shots were made down the stretch. You look at the Memorial Day miracle with Sean Elliott. You know, seriously? Yeah. Sean probably couldn't do that again if he right, tried. Right. <laughs> he couldn't do that again if he tried. But that just shows, like, when I say, like, all you have to do is get on a run. If you have all the boxes checked and your ceiling is that high, if you get on a run at the right time of the year, you guys did it. Be careful. <laughs> so let's say career-wise, let's say if you if you weren't doing the if you weren't doing this with the Thunder, what would you be doing? Something involving children. I love kids. You know, I have a basketball camp every summer, and it's the most enjoyable week of my summer. So any. And something involved before I actually the NBA actually became a reality for me. I wanted to be a teacher. 
Okay. You know, I really, really enjoy working with children, communicating with children, you know, so it would definitely be something, a, a big brothers, big brothers program, something like that. So on that, like, cool. I just have a question, like for like a kid that's wanting to pursue basketball or something like that. What, what's like the one piece of advice you give to a kid like that? Mm. Believe in you. That's basically simple. It sounds easy, <laughs> but it's actually super hard. Yeah, yeah it, it is. <laughs> it's, it's very tough to do. And, and, you know, I, I tell kids in my camp all the time, basketball is like life. You can't really cheat it. Your work will eventually show up. You know, what you put into it is what you'll get out of it. So if you're not putting, and I tell my daughters this all the time, if you're not putting in the time and you're not putting in the work and you're not putting in the effort, you may be able to get away with that for a lengthy amount of time. But when you go head to head with that person that is putting in the time, the work and the effort, that person's going to kick your butt. Yeah, yeah. Suddenly, so you can't suddenly shows it. up. Right. <laughs> Sounds like Jason was asking for a friend there, yeah. right? Yeah, that's <laughs> for a friend. For a friend. <laughs> like, not for I, me. I, not, I think not I for still me. got a chance. You, okay. you talked about your daughters and, and playing soccer. I think it would be awesome to see you out on the sideline just coaching coaching some soccer. Some you know what? Soccer. Like one of my, my youngest daughter, our youngest daughter plays soccer. Our oldest daughter plays volleyball. And I love the fact that they play a game, two games that I've never played and have no idea what's going on. <laughs> because you know the only thing I care about is that they compete. Yeah. Right. That's it. I don't Just care if you win or lose. Effort. Right. I don't care if you win or lose. I, you know, I don't care if you score. Blah, blah, blah. I don't even know the rules. I don't even know the rules of soccer. <laughs> Offsides. No I don't one know does. what that means. To me, offsides is like cherry picking in basketball, I guess. <laughs> I guess. I don't know the rules of, of soccer. I don't know all the rules of volleyball. When you can sub, when you can't. I just want you to go out there and compete. You know what I mean? When you get in the car, I'm not going to say, you know what? I'm proud of you because you scored. I'm right. going to say I'm proud of you because you played really hard today. Do they have that same competitive spirit about them? That my you... young one does. Yeah. <laughs> my young one does. And my, my older one is developing it. You know, she's, oh, she's cool. starting to get it. She's 12, so mm -hmm. she's starting to get it. But, like, me and my wife, my wife played soccer, are ultra competitive. Yeah. <laughs> ultra competitive. Like, <laughs> big time competitive. And our young one is ultra competitive. And our our our, our, our um our oldest daughter, she's slowly but surely growing into that competitive mind frame. What's she's that? nicer than everyone else. Yeah, she is. You're, you're exactly right. She has such an old spirit. She couldn't have like, Dad, you know, it just makes me mad sometimes. It just seems like we don't want to win. Like, Baby girl, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, next. Toughest player you've ever had to guard? Man, good luck. <laughs> good luck. I, I, can't, I can't give you one person. What about a single night where you've been on someone, they were hot, and it stuck out to you, and you're like, there's I nothing I can do to this guy. To me, okay, I tell you the hardest guys to guard in the league. The hardest guys to guard in the league are the guys with freedom. Ah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Or the guys that have the freedom to Just shoot. Just the green light. Like, like, I couldn't imagine what it's like to guard James Harden right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't imagine. because Or Steph Curry. Because they can shoot from anywhere they want at any time. They can do anything they want to do on the floor. So, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Allen Iverson. Um, Stephon Marbury was a tough cover. I'll even go a little bit further back. Terrell Brandon. Mm. Sam Cassell. KG's teammates. Right. Like any of those guys, because the thing about Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant is they would just jump over you. Yeah. <laughs> so you can do you can do everything you wanted to do to stay in front of them. And put your hand up, but with your hand is up, and they're just elevating over your hand. It's like, just kind of, no. right. it's just kind of defeating purpose. I like, wish okay, people, why am I even here? I wish people could have seen. Yeah, like, yeah. it's like, why am I even here? Like, you, know, you, you, you slide your feet like great D, great D, great D, and then when he comes to that point and he jump stops and he elevates, it's like, okay, I don't even see you, little man. You know, and then Allen Iverson's quickness, his ability to change direction with the basketball, and just the freedom that he had to dribble. I'm not yeah. talking about a guy who will dribble five to seven times. I'm talking about a guy, you know how hard it is to keep a guy in front of you when he has 25 dribbles? That's <laughs> yeah. almost impossible to do. You know, so, and Sam Cassell and Terrell Brandon, just their ability that they mastered something that today, guys in today's NBA can't relate to. And that is that 15-foot shot. That mid-range game, mm -hmm. their mid-range game was incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Where Sam Cassell basically worked on coming down and pulling up in your face with a hand in his. 
So it was like it was it was it like didn't nothing. Him at all. Nothing. It was like nothing to him. It's like I guess you get a little bit of that out of Sean Livingston today. You know, he, he kind of has that same mindset. He still hangs on to that mid range shot, and it doesn't care if you're there or not. He's, right. He's shooting, but he has a high shot. Yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's easier for him. Yeah. He has a very very <laughs> high shot. Rate. That's mm-hmm. what makes Kevin Durant the second best player on the planet. Yes. And I know that sucks to say, but <laughs> it's the truth. Yeah. You know, you yeah. can't think of a guy in history that can do what that man can do. Yeah, I mean, because for him, he can get a good shot whenever he wants. Yeah. Literally, whenever he wants. There's not a guy in the league that can bother his shot. Yeah. Because he shoots the ball with the high shot release like a Rasheed Wallace, but he's 6'11 <laughs> with the ability and skill set to put the ball on the floor and get to yeah. wherever he wants to and pull up. He'll cross you over, step back, and then hit it in your face, and you're like, dude, you're 7'. And he's 7 foot. Foot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, Come on, man. How like, is this possible? Yeah, this is the video <laughs> game stuff. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, we talked a little bit about other, other players around mm-hmm. the league. Who's your favorite non-Thunder player to watch? Tough spot, <laughs> or just some some of the guys. I, you know, for me, um, Anthony Davis is amazing, and like to 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 watch him play is that dude special. Yeah, that dude is special. Like what he can do at that size with his skill set, his ability to to against a guy that is his size to create space, to go around that guy, to block shots, to rebound, to run, to finish, all the pieces of the puzzle that you can put together. Yeah, and that team that team had a built-in excuse to sort of slide right. down and mm-hmm. struggle this year after Cousins went out and like Davis just completely steps up and just puts yeah. him on his back and it's been awesome it's to watch. It's a couple dudes, man. Like Well, yeah, it definitely Le- is. Le- LeBron James. <laughs> yeah. Le- le- let's be honest. He's pretty yeah. good. Le- le- okay, <laughs> he le- is pretty good. Le- let's be honest here. This dude is 15 years in. He's 15 years in. Doing what we are seeing him do every night. Going to play all 82 games this year. Yeah. Leads the, leads the league in minutes, and I think he did last year too. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. What he is doing is incredible because when LeBron James came out, I'm from Ohio. I'm from Ohio, so I've always known about LeBron since he was like two. You know, so, <laughs> he was born, and everyone's right. like, "This is like, the guy. This is the guy. This is the chosen one." So, so when LeBron, got a when he on. comes out, you're thinking to yourself, "It's amazing how much pressure he has. No one can ever live up to that." And he's lived up to it and surpassed it. Pretty crazy. Yeah, pretty crazy so, what he's been able to do. Do you have any, or did you have any, like pregame pregame rituals or anything you did I, before I am extremely games? Extremely superstitious. Really? Oh, let's hear about I, this. But I'm this excited way, about but it. it. Wasn't it wasn't like anything particular that I did. It depends on what I did that day and the way I played. Okay. Like I told Leslie McCasin last night, she has now she has to sing before every game. <laughs> <laughs> That I was like so it. Funny. I yeah. like it. But you have seen for every game now because you saying this team came out, they won by twenty points in Miami. You have to sing before every. This is, a, this is a thing we need to keep going. Right. And, and it's got to be like a city thing because she did it because she was in Miami. Right. Okay. So I don't know what you can sing in Oklahoma City. Ah, oh, gotta be something. Just she can the, just sing the state the, song. The Oklahoma. Okay. Who would know the state song? She should. <laughs> Do you know it? Yeah. Do you? Yeah. The o Oklahoma the thing. Oklahoma where the wind comes. In. I mean, they play in the arena. Yeah. Just it, it was in style. a play. Right. That's a thing. Right. Wasn't right. it? Yeah, man, <laughs> right. The, like, people in, nice. people in <laughs> Maine know this song. The Oklahoma song? Yeah. It's like, what's it from? Where did it originate from? from a, I don't know. It's from a play, play right? in Oklahoma, I think. Yeah. We from may the, be the completely screwing that up. Yeah. yeah. We, we, you, better say, you better be right. So <laughs> probably you not. better be right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll leave you with this one. It's a positive one. Best teammate you ever had? Tim Duncan. I knew that was going to be the answer. <laughs> what, what made him so great? Is he would constantly put the organization before himself. What was best for that team, even though he's the best power forward to ever lace up a pair of shoes, he would always put that before anything that had to do with him. You know, and, and look at the state that he let the Senate, left the San Antonio Spurs in when he left. That speaks to his selflessness. Yeah, I mean, how much credit does Tim Duncan really deserve for their sustainability? Oh, my God. All of it. Really? <laughs> All of it. And, and this is not discrediting David Robinson. It's not discrediting Greg Popovich. I was there for Tim Duncan's retirement night, and Pop had one of the best lines ever. And it's so true. He said, you know what? I want to thank you, Tim Duncan, for allowing me to coach you. Because that set the standard for everything moving forward. Wow. And now you see everything that's going on in San Antonio right now. I used to say years ago, 
years ago. And again, I'm not discrediting Greg Popovich and how great he is. To me, he's the greatest NBA coach ever. I'm not discrediting David Robinson and who he is. But I said years ago when Tim Duncan walks out that door, that culture is walking out with him. Ooh. That's a lot more that's a lot more difficult than what people think. And for people to say, you know what, Kawhi Leonard can now pick up that torch and carry it on, it has a lot more to do with what you do on the basketball floor. It has a lot more to do with averaging 25 points a game and, and so on and so forth. And I'm not saying Kawhi Leonard's not capable of that, but that's something that has to be groomed. That's something that you have to grow into. You know, somebody doesn't just leave and you say, all right, man, I'm ready to be the face of the franchise overnight. <laughs> because now you have to learn to deal with stuff Similar to the way that Tim did. Yeah. And for that to happen, like we talked about, generational, for that to happen, that means you have to put that organization ahead of your own interest a lot of times. And that's probably hard to do as a player. It is hard to do. Especially, it is hard to do. Yeah. No question. You will you will very rarely find players that will do that. Because as a player, you are bred. You are bred to do what's best for you. And and at the same time, I mean the the owners they might be around forever. They might have the team forever. They're gonna profit off this team forever as a player. Your career, who knows how long it's gonna be? You gotta do right. what you can. You, when you the can. loyalty doesn't always go both ways. The loyalty, rarely never, does. Yeah. The loyalty right. never goes both ways. You know, I, on 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 radio all the time, I, I'm constantly talking about the fact that when a player does what's in his best interest, he's vilified for it. But when a team does what's in their best interest. It's a business. <laughs> so it's only a business one way. It's never a business when a player does what yeah. he feels is right. right. <laughs> you know, he's selfish. He's yeah. greedy. But when an organization does what's in their best interest, it's like, oh, well, you know what? You got to deal with it because it's a business. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. It's a double standard of sports. It's how it works, I guess. Yep. It's never going to change, unfortunately. Ain't <laughs> <laughs> that the truth? Ain't that the truth? Man, thanks so much for being here, AD. We really appreciate it. For sure, fellas. Awesome. Thank for you so sure. much. Awesome time. AD, everybody.